Several human species walked the Earth only 50,000 years ago, now there's just one. But why is there only one human species left on the planet? Today we look up at the stars and wonder if we're alone in the universe, we wonder what it might be like to meet other intelligent species like us. It's profoundly sad to think that we once did, and now they are all gone. The Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, were stocky hunters adapted to Europe's cold steppes. The Denisovans inhabited Asia, while the more primitive Homo erectus lived in Indonesia, Homo longi in China, and Homo bodoensis in Africa. Several short, small-brained species survived alongside them, Homo nalidi in South Africa, Homo luzonensis in the Philippines, and Homo floresiensis in Flores. By 30,000 years ago, they were all gone. The disappearance of these other human species resembles a mass extinction, but there's no obvious environmental catastrophe, such as volcanic eruptions, climate change or asteroid impact, driving this disappearance. Instead, the timing of these extinctions suggests they were caused by the spread of a new species, evolving 260,000 to 350,000 years ago, the Homo sapiens. Not so very long ago, we shared this planet with several other species of human, all of them clever, resourceful and excellent hunters. So why did only the Homo sapiens survive? Homo sapiens are a uniquely dangerous species, but we are most dangerous to other human populations, because we compete for resources and land. There's little reason to think that ancient Homo sapiens were less territorial, less violent, less intolerant, less human than today. History is full of examples of people warring, displacing and wiping out other groups over territory. Like language or tool use, a capacity for and tendency to engage in warfare is arguably an intrinsic, instinctive part of human nature, say anthropologists. What's more, the history of human evolution has been an arms race, from rocks, to clubs, to spears, and then to spear throwers and finally the bow and arrow. These hunting weapons made humans more and more deadly. Huge debates rage about human origins, but the broad consensus among scientists is that all the different species of human that have ever existed were descended from ape like creatures that walked upright in Africa more than 6 million years ago. These creatures had many descendants, most of which became extinct, but the first creature we would recognize as human first appeared in Africa 2 million years ago. Known as Homo erectus, they made tools and were proficient hunters. Their bones suggest they would have been powerful athletes, capable of feats that would rival a modern Olympic athlete. Homo erectus seems to have evolved during a long period of terrible drought, which dried out tropical rainforests and created vast deserts in Africa. This human species was equipped to cope with heat. They would have been largely hairless, allowing them to sweat more efficiently. Homo erectus could also travel and hunt in the middle of the day, when most animals rest. And we know that they traveled long distances, because they did not stay in Africa. A hungry meat eater, Homo erectus became the first human to leave Africa and colonize Eurasia. Here, in a new and lush environment, they evolved. Archaeological evidence show they spread over an area ranging from Turkey to China to Indonesia, but the population may not have been that large. These were small groups of hunters and gatherers. These are people that are being very mobile, in open country, to get to their food ahead of the competition. So in that sense, they are very like us in terms of their overall body shape and body build. But even these powerful humans went extinct, with the last remaining populations found in Java, which disappeared just around the time that modern humans began moving into the region. Moreover, recent findings suggest that Homo sapiens also left Africa, around 120,000 years ago. We traveled in small numbers, possibly no more than 100 in the first wave. Then we spread out, with some eventually reaching Europe then occupied by the Neanderthals, while others moved east until they reached India and China. There is archaeological evidence that they arrived just in time for a truly cataclysmic event. Around 74,000 years ago Mount Toba, 
A volcano in Southeast Asia erupted in spectacular fashion, the biggest explosion in the last two million years. Because of its magnitude it is classified as a supervolcanic eruption. It produced vast amounts of ash. Driven by the winds, clouds of white toba ash covered huge swathes of Asia, including much of the Indian subcontinent, where it can still be found today. Whether it was the effects of toba, or the arrival of modern humans, the eruption marks the end of archaic humans' occupation of Asia. Over the next 40,000 years archaic humans were slowly driven out, probably by a combination of climate change, and the effects of being outcompeted for scarce food by the spread of modern humans. Yet, Neanderthals were bigger and more powerful than Homo sapiens, so why did we thrive when they did not? The most obvious answer is that we had bigger brains, but it turns out that what matters is not overall brain size, but the areas where the brain is larger. The brain of Neanderthals did not devote a lot of space to the part of the brain that controls language and speech. One of the crucial elements of Homo sapiens adaptations is that it combines complex planning, developed in the front of the brain, with language and the ability to spread new ideas from one individual to another. Planning, communication and even trade led among other things, to the development of better tools and weapons, which spread rapidly across the population. Whereas the fossil records suggest that Neanderthals went on making the same basic spears and hand axes for several hundred thousand years. Our ancestors, by contrast, created smaller, more sophisticated weapons, like a spear which can be thrown, with obvious advantages when it comes to hunting and to fighting. The same advantages helped Homo sapiens outcompete another rival human, the Neanderthals, who died out about 40,000 years ago as the Ice Age limited available food supplies. Even 50,000 years ago, we still have several human species on Earth, and that's a strange concept for us. We're the only survivors of all of those great evolutionary experiments in how to be human. Although most archaic humans went extinct, they appear to have left descendants on the island of Flores in Indonesia. These humans, Homo floresiensis, also known as hobbits, survived until around 50,000 years ago. This was also suspiciously close to when modern humans arrived in the region. Optimists have painted ancient humans such as Neanderthals as peaceful, noble savages, and have argued that our culture, not our nature, creates violence. But field studies, historical accounts, and archaeology all show that war in primitive cultures was intense, pervasive and lethal. Neolithic weapons such as clubs, throwing spears, axes and the bow, combined with guerrilla tactics like raids and ambushes, were devastatingly effective. Violence was the leading cause of death among men in these societies, and war saw higher casualty levels per person than both world wars. Old bones and artifacts show this violence is ancient. A 55,000-year-old Neanderthal called Shanidar III from Iraq has a spear wound to his ribcage, and a 400,000-year-old Neanderthal from Spain has a bashed-in skull. It's unlikely that the other human species were much more peaceful. Many Neanderthal skeletons show patterns of trauma consistent with warfare, but sophisticated weapons likely gave Homo sapiens a military advantage. The arsenal of early Homo sapiens probably projectile weapons like javelins and spear throwers, throwing sticks and clubs. Complex tools and culture would also have helped to sufficiently harvest a wider range of animals and plants, feeding larger tribes, and giving our species a strategic advantage in numbers. This would have allowed us to take over hunting lands from other human species, driving them to starvation. But cave paintings, carvings, and musical instruments hint at something far more dangerous, a sophisticated capacity for abstract thought and communication. The ability to cooperate, plan, strategize, manipulate and deceive may have been our ultimate weapon. The incompleteness of the fossil record makes it hard to test these ideas. But in Europe, the only place with a relatively complete archaeological record, fossils show that within a few thousand years of our arrival, Neanderthals vanished. Traces of Neanderthal DNA in some Eurasian people prove we didn't just replace them after they went extinct. Elsewhere, DNA tells of other encounters with other archaic humans. 
Polynesian and Australian peoples have DNA from Denisovans. DNA from another species, possibly Homo erectus, occurs in some island Southeast Asian people. African genomes show traces of DNA from yet another archaic species. The fact that we interbred with these other species proves that they disappeared only after encountering us. But why would our ancestors wipe out their relatives? Our elimination of other species probably wasn't a planned, coordinated effort of the sort practiced by civilizations, but a war of attrition. The end result, however, was just as final. Raid by raid, ambush by ambush, valley by valley, modern humans would have worn down own enemies and taken their land. Yet the extinction of Neanderthals at least, took a long time, thousands of years. But while Neanderthals lost the war, to hold on so long they must have fought and won many battles against us, suggesting a level of intelligence close to our own. There's such a huge gulf between ourselves and our nearest primate relatives, including gorillas, chimpanzees and bonobos. If that gap were populated by other hominids, we'd see that gap as not so much a gulf, but rather a continuum with steps on the way. We'd still think of our species as special, but maybe we are not so special after all. I wanted to tell you about Ren, the sponsor of this video. Ren is for anyone who wants to tackle the climate crisis but isn't sure where to start. No single person can end the climate crisis on their own, but we can all make a difference. Ren helps you fund the best climate solutions and start taking climate action. Offsetting your carbon footprint is a way to take control of your emissions and commit to living sustainably. One of their projects is community tree planting. This project helps subsistence farmers in Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania plant trees and sequester carbon. In addition to sequestering carbon, growing trees on farmland can increase yield and improve soil quality. They pay farmers for how much carbon is sequestered, and their farms become more productive. Offset your carbon footprint on Wren. The first 100 people who sign up using the link in the description will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. Once you sign up to make a monthly contribution to offset your carbon footprint, you receive monthly updates from the projects you support. You get to see what your money is spent on, with photos and details on every tree planted, every acre reforested, every ton of carbon offset. Just click the link in the description to get started. Thanks for watching. Please check out these other videos or join us in the comments section. If you're not yet subscribed, please click that big red button now, so you don't miss any of our highly compelling videos. Thank you.